You're listening to Cloud Security Reinvented, a podcast for security leaders with a focus on the cloud. Learn best practices from fellow security professionals and how they disconnect from it all at the end of the day. Cloud Security Reinvented. Good morning, or depending on when you are in the world, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. Welcome to Cloud Security Reinvented. I'm your host, Andy Ellis. Before I introduce our guest for the week, a quick word from our sponsor, Orca Security. Orca provides agentless security and compliance for your public cloud infrastructure, enabling you to detect and prioritize security risks in minutes, not months. I am here today with Brian Hoagley, managing partner at Side Channel, CEO of RealCISO.io, and host of CISO Life. And if that's not enough of a mouthful, Brian is also the co-author of Mastering the Fundamentals Using the NIST Cybersecurity Framework. Welcome, Brian. Andy, thanks for having me. Really glad to have you here. You know, across someone's security career, hopefully we as professionals grow, but the world we're in changes and the environment of our employers becomes different. And I'd love to get some insight from you today, especially in context of the transition from the on-premise world that many of us started in for IT, to the world of cloud that has increasingly become the default model for IT infrastructure. But first, let's look at your career journey. You started your career as a pen tester before you joined the US Army Reserves, thank you also for your service, as an IT specialist, but a fun side job of being a FOIA officer, that's the Freedom of Information Act. Usually when we talk about our military stories, you always get to drop the joke, you know, I'd tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. But your job was literally telling people things. What was that like? So it it actually started out, you know, as a as as a pen tester, kind of in that space as a young adult, very exciting role, right? Kind of before college. But then, you know, as a young adult, wasn't very good with money. So I actually spent all my money when I decided to go to college. So joining the Army Reserves was actually my way of paying for college. And that, and that was the impetus to that in to that entire obviously there was a you know, a, a feeling of national pride and, and, a, and a duty with both of my parents having been in the military, having always wanted to do it. But that was really kind of the catalyst. And so, yeah, I joined the Army Reserves. I was in that while in college. And the Reserves operates much different than active duty. So the roles you get aren't exactly ever lined up with why you were trained for what you were doing. And Reserve units have a tendency to have a kind of, hey, we need this person in this billet or someone needs to be doing this. And there's really, there wasn't a, really a lot of work associated with FOIA. So the group I was with was a training unit. It's actually since disbanded, they had collapsed from six brigades down to four brigades. And I don't even think the unit I was in up near Syracuse even exists anymore. But they, uh, they needed somebody to be in this billet. And me being a college student, as well as with my background in IT and security, they figured, hey, <laughs> you, you might be a good fit for in case we have FOIA requests. So unfortunately, <laughs> I never actually had to go through an entire FOIA release, although I did seek and have to manage some that came in, but didn't actually have to get fulfilled. So I never, I never got to see a FOIA request actually fulfilled all the way through. But, you know, as part of the job, I had to learn how to do that, the paperwork, the process, you know, the government's pretty big on process and paperwork. So, um, yeah. And yep. it's just one of those things where I made it easy for the unit to not have to think about that as an issue. And again, the type of FOIA requests that you get around training, we're usually dealing with servicemen and women who had gone through the training and wanted to look at or didn't have access to their records. And you could actually request that yep. through a FOIA piece. I actually did that myself. I actually did a FOIA request on myself. And that's how I got everything I ever needed, just so I had an old copy of my own documentation. <laughs> so I knew what I had. That's a brilliant idea. I should maybe do that. But I, I will have to tell you that getting assigned an extra job that has nothing to do with what you're trained as is completely normal in active duty as well. Despite being an information warfare engineer on paper, the most important value I provided to my first unit was as the snack officer doing the you know twice a week run to the commissary to make sure that our ops unit was uh, well fed and well hydrated. Sure. Sure. Yeah, my first my first role was in my reserve unit was actually in supply. I was like, ah, oh. but yep. you get to learn a lot about logistics oh. and again paperwork and keeping an inventory, which believe it or not paid off later on in my life as a information security professional. 
Yeah, you did definitely draw a lot from the, all of your different experiences. And I think then you you went in and were in the federal sector for about a decade before pivoting into the insurance industry. So that mm -hmm. feels like that could either be a really big or a really small transition. So what was that like? What were the biggest differences and what were the surprising commonalities between the two? Yeah, the the leaving government and working within government for as long as I did and, and the programs that I you know worked on and I had this idea of what corporate America, true corporate America, where they were with with regards to information security and practices. And I stepped into a role as really this insurance company's first vice president and, and vice president level and CISO. And I kind of walked in expecting a little more than what I honestly saw. I figured, again, corporate America was a little farther ahead than what government was doing. I was wrong. And I think that was that was first kind of cultural shock. But the biggest piece was actually kind of funding and kind of expectations on me. I, I remember having a discussion with my then boss who reported to the CEO and and him having, a you know, hey, you know, the budget that we're going to be putting together, you know, at first it started, you know, less than a million. And then it was, you know, I got it to a million. I think I, I grew it to maybe five to seven million dollars over the four years I was there. Still, I think a little short on on appropriately, you know, finance to be able to make this happen. And I remember a discussion somewhere during that time where he kind of pointed out, hey, you know, are you going to be able to handle this budget? You know, are you going to be, you know, because I'm a younger fella, I get that. And I think there was a, a yep. an expectation or at least a concern, you know, are you going to be able to, you know, correctly spend and budget and manage, you know, $5 million. And I remember turning to him and, and knowing that his entire IT budget was $120 million, And I was like, listen, you know, where I just came from at the Pentagon, our security budget was bigger than your current budget. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be fine. So yep. that was kind of eye opening. I, you know, the um, my expectations walking into government and, and his expectations of me coming out of government. And there was this kind of misalignment on, you know, kind of seniority and maturity when it came to, you know, handling the, you know, implementing a security program. There's no question ever about can Brian implement a, the correct security program? What is he bringing to the table from that? It was kind of the business of of security, you know, is he capable of of delivering that as expected? So yeah, that's a really fascinating. I hadn't thought about just the the scale differences. Because you know, I was technically an acquisitions officer when I was in the Air Force, because I was just, you know, had a computer systems engineering degree. And so my last job was in a test and evaluation unit for electronic system center. And very similarly, you know, I remember when I came out and people were like, oh, you don't know dealing with big money projects. And I'm like, I was just on like seven different multi-billion dollar acquisitions right. programs. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, no, it's a it's a different, you know, weapons of mass destruction acquisition was was kind of in our bailiwick. Right. If you didn't have direct control over that type of budget, you were constantly operating with other people influencing or dependent on other organizations that had budgets as large or larger than yours. So you knew yep. you knew the dollar amounts and what they could do and, and how to appropriately kind of spend those to get yours and then help others get their you know missions accomplished. So it's interesting when you kind of look across that disparity, it, it does seem to be a, a, a theme amongst you know prior service and, and DOD personnel when they step into government, that culture shock on both sides of the aisle. Yeah, no, it reminds me there's a, a thing I learned in the military that I did bring forward and I hadn't really connected it until this moment, that as an acquisitions officer, you'd often have printed on the back of your business card a statement that said, nothing I say verbally can be taken as a contract change order. And this is really important because there are cases of defense contractors who would walk an acquisitions officer through like an assembly line or a plant, and they'd be like, oh, what do you think of the color of this thing? And when the you know, officer just you know, jokingly or whatever said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I think blue might be better. You know, they'd come back the next day and everything was painted blue, and there's a multi-million dollar charge on the contract. And so you have to learn to say that. And as a CISO, I learned to say when somebody would walk by me in the hall and be like, hey, I'm working on this new project. And they'd tell me about it. And I'd always say, you know, my commentary should not be taken as approval of what you're doing. There's a process for us to look at this. Just because you talk to me in the hallway does not mean you get to say, oh, Andy knows about this and we're good. Yeah. So now you actually run a VCSO company and you provide a risk assessment platform on the side. But I think for a lot of folks, they've never really encountered the VCSO market. So what is that market like? Like who are the buyers? What does being a VCSO look like? Yeah, no, thanks for asking. It's 
it's more than just a work for me. I, I think at this point, it's really become passion. When I was in government and then even within corporate, the thing I saw as a CISO were my vendors, my suppliers, other you know smaller firms that my organizations were dependent on for services or capabilities. And there was never someone like me there that I could talk to about their security posture. It always seemed you know, very shoestring, right? And I had very big expectations about some of these, you know, suppliers and vendors because they were either accessing my data, uh, had infrastructure access to my organization. So secure, you know, their security was was very, very important to me. And, you know, during, you know, really the last 10 years, that's been something that I've kind of really wrestled with, you know, why is this, this middle market, this small business truly underserved when it comes to cybersecurity, uh, risk management, even privacy? And you know that's what I set out to to take to take on with Side Channel in 2019. It's building these information security programs, privacy security programs for middle market and small businesses. And the person that can you know really orchestrate and oversee that is a chief information security officer. What we've done is you know figured out that a virtual chief information security officer can be the person who can oversee that. You know, it's it's really just consulting and it's having someone who's got the experience and, and the capabilities to deliver it. But, you know, taking from people who've actually done those roles at larger enterprises was what I figured out seems to be a real difference between just general consulting, kind of your big four kind of consulting approach, you know, or folks who kind of say, hey, I'm your VC, so and they've never actually done the job. You know, my view was let's take people who are actually experienced in that role and deliver them to the mid-market. You know, the piece that I see is everyone's like, well, do you, you know, is there enough of a, a market out there for that? In the Fortune 2000, there's only 2,000 companies. Those folks have traditionally yep. chief information security officers. They're probably best positioned to have CISOs. There's a lot of companies, hundreds of thousands of companies outside the Fortune 2000. And most, if not all of them, require some diligence or look at what their security program looks like. And the question is, who's going to lead that? Who can lead that? And can they afford it? So, you know, the market is actually very, very hot when it comes to this space. We've grown tremendously over the last, you know, two plus years. And it's it's an area that people are, you know, genuinely looking at. And it's not just because of what's in the news, but I think people are really realizing, hey, we should be doing our own diligence and, and, and security practices, the same way we put kind of wrappers and guidelines and posts around financials and, and sales and marketing. You know, we, you know, most organizations are now realizing we need a structure when it comes to our security so that it doesn't become an impedance to us, you know, either later on or we get caught up or caught off guard by regulation or a customer's asking us about our security posture. We can't articulate it or, you know, the board or leadership is, is getting wise and starting to ask about these things, you know, and, who can actually say that? You lean on the CFO to talk about the financials, you know, even in a mid-market company of CEOs, CFOs, but who can actually talk about and, and lead the security program that has the knowledge to be able to do so? And, and that's where we've really made a great fit. And we're, we're having a lot of fun doing it. And I'm seeing a change in, you know, the tide of, you know, more of these organizations looking for this type of service. Yep. No, it's kind of neat. So I think you know, now that we've looked at your world of security, like cloud went from being like nobody used cloud to now everybody mm -hmm. uses cloud. So okay. how have you seen your approach to security in your world change as that cloud shift has happened? So I think a lot of it is centered around identity. And that's that seems to be the biggest component from before cloud to kind of now cloud or even native cloud operations. And we see a lot of this within clients where, you know, what was on-prem, you know, can almost be lifted and shifted and those type of workloads and operations can, can be moved into the cloud. But still, identity seems to be the thing that lags or is still not addressed. Yeah. It's, it's as if, you know, yes, we moved everything to cloud operations, but we didn't change our behavior about how to still administer and manage systems or networks. We're still doing mm -hmm. the wrong things. We're just now doing them on someone else's computer and at scale. Yep. <clears throat> so when you say the wrong things, I'm really curious, what, what sort of things do you think are the wrong things there? Yeah, you know, overly permissive administrative privileges is the first thing yep. I come to. I think it's, it's the, one of the 
biggest issues and then followed you yep. know shortly by misconfiguration of of standard systems i mean the lack of deploying secured baseline configurations into your cloud operations or your on prem you know virtualization or even you know a hardware uh, based system that still happens i mean those two things to me seem yep. to be the the biggest areas of concern and quite honestly probably the the top two things that we address when you know we work start working with either cloud native clients or companies that are looking to move to cloud it's like well where is this component where you're addressing this risk as part of it? you can't just lift and shift bad behavior like now's the time to change bad behavior as you're going into a new environment let's you have an opportunity to start over yep. almost start fresh let's do the right things from day one so i think every, we all have misconceptions when we look at other people's industries so what's probably the biggest misconception about cloud security in your industry today that others from outside would be surprised by? Well, you know, I think we we see and work across a lot of different sectors and, and verticals. And I think the one thing that seems to be true across all of them is, well, if we move this to the cloud, that issue is taken care of because that provider is doing that. Because that's what I think we signed up for. And the reality is, it's like, yep. no, you you still have responsibilities that you need to be able to address yourself and own cloud services are really only, you know, it's, it's the, it's that model, right? It's cloud has, you know, it's responsibilities here. Maybe your application has responsibilities here. And then you as the owner have your responsibilities here and people are just thinking, Oh, all of this is, is done by the cloud or the provider or the SaaS yep. platform. And that's just not true. And that seems to happen across just about every sector we touch. And again, especially with the middle market, which is traditionally, you know, both underserved, but maybe they don't have the expertise. So it's an area where they're just kind of a bit naive into, well, who's responsible for what? Yep, that's, uh, I think that's, that's probably re does resonate. As we think about resonation, you know, there are practices that have evolved over time. But if you go back to the pre-cloud era, what's one practice that we maybe did at the time that even resonates more strongly today that is a more fundamental that we need to continue doing? I think actually it's it's still administrative capabilities. I, I, I think there's kind yep. of this, well, we need to get into you know cloud, so let's make it easy. Let's remove the barrier so we can quickly go do that. And it's you know overly permissive in kind of the setup. And then there's, you know, people kind of forget about the entitlements now that are in place as you kind of move mm -hmm. forward you know that's something that still just does not seem to be you know very much evolved you know conversely if i can kind of take the flip side to that asset management yep. you know now kind of seems to be a, a native part of anything that is cloud so taking more and more advantage of that aspect where before when you were totally on-prem mm -hmm. asset management asset identification inventorying was a huge huge hurdle or work. But now, you know, there's much more tools and capabilities so that that can be done, you know, easier. Do I think it's being as done as much as it should be or even taken into account for security postures? No, we still see people short on that. But it's a lot yep. easier to start doing that. And I think that's, that's an important shift. Okay. Now let's flip side of question. What practice do we have in our industry that we ought to have just buried a long time ago? Ooh, I don't, I don't know this one. Um, this is always a fun soapbox just to see like, what, what do you hate about our industry that you wish we'd stop doing? Okay. So, you know, I do believe in training a lot, but I think what we're seeing with how people are taking phishing tests and using them in punitive ways is, is inappropriate. Yep. I've always believed that, you know, you build a security program, you know, with training and everything to educate employees. And using phishing in an almost transparent, non-punitive way against employees, but also just, is any of the training taking effect? And, and I think a lot of organizations seem to be sold right now on, hey, we just need to be doing phishing training, and therefore, you know, we have a security training program in place, and it checks the box. And they're not appropriately using phishing training. You know, yes, there's some studies out there right. that phishing training can actually be negative, and, but I, don't, I think there's ways to use it that are appropriate. Right now, it seems to be kind of teetering on the edge of a compliance initiative where it's just like, oh, we need to have this. So we, d we do these four a year and we don't actually care about the negative behavioral changes that it might impact our employees. It, it's, 
they're not taking the results out of that and using it to actually inf- to reinform the training program that they've built. I've always truly believed that you have to test what you're training on. I mean, it's like school. You study a material, yep. you then take a test. Are people actually understanding the material? Great. Move on to the next thing. We need to do that with security training as well. And maybe it's not phishing training. Uh, maybe it's not phishing tests as part of that, but something else. Maybe it's surveys. Maybe it's just actually you know, more granular testing, not, you know, gotchas, right? So we need to bury, I don't know if we bury the whole thing, but we need to bury the aspects of this that don't seem to be really working yet seem to be getting much more and more play. And certainly bury the punitive aspects of, I'm just going to you know want to fire people who fail, you know, repeated tests. Because I get that question a lot. I'll say, I think I had one of the, the better sort of phishing systems which was not even oriented around phishing was around social engineering. We mm-hmm. literally just set up a mailing list that anybody in the company could be on. And if you had a published phone number, we put you onto the list. So you didn't get a choice. And rather than having people report social engineering or phishing attacks to information security, cause God, why do I want to hear every single right. thing? We had them report to this list because what would often happen is somebody would call our Tokyo office and pretend to be the CEO or ask for somebody's phone number. And when they got hung up on, they would then call the Singapore office and then they'd call the London office, right? They'd just walk through. And so what would happen is they'd get the first one, somebody would type in a note and say, yep, just got this call. And now everybody is informed and warned. And we told people like, and if you fall for it and you give out a phone number, it's okay, report it anyway. Like, don't hide it. There'll be no punishment for failing, but we want everybody else to learn from your failure. Well, here was the funny part. When we ran phishing tests, people would reverse engineer the phishing test, figure out it was a phishing test, and then report it to the mailing list. So everybody knew about the phishing test in their inboxes. And like, it really frustrated the IT team that was running phishing tests. Sure. Well, you know, that's, that's interesting. That behavior behind the scenes of who's running it Right, because I've I've seen that behavior too in GRC analysts specifically. This this gotcha mm-hmm. mentality, right? And yes. and we re- we really honestly, as a security practitioners and as an industry, we need to not just bury. We need to completely kill this gotcha mentality that stems out of you know old school audit thinking or GRC analyst or policy wonks or or whoever's managing a system mm-hmm. where their entire thing is well, I need you know these things managed right and if it's not exactly as this says you don't get credit it's like we need to move to risk management which is there is gray there is the ability to accept you know risk as long as it's appropriate but this pure black and white view and this gotcha mentality that exists within security professionals that i have seen i mean we just need to get rid of that it's not helping anyone anyone at all so yeah i i would be I mean, I'm curious, like, you know, those, those IT professionals that were manning that system for you, do they kind of fit that profile? Do those personalities seem well, some to be- some of them did and some, folks? yeah, some of them learned from it. It was a, a great opportunity for us to help them grow. But sure. I do think as an industry, I think you're right. That's probably one of our biggest challenges is we historically are adversarial to our own businesses. Right, right. And so that's the thing for us to, to focus on and work on. So for you, what has been the biggest surprise of the cloud era? You know, not to pick on any provider, but I will. With the mid with the mid market space, I was expecting a much bigger presence from Microsoft and Azure, and mm-hmm. instead, AWS is about seventy five eighty percent of our clients, and GCP is the other is, is the remainder. It, oh, I that's really, really surprising. It, it, it is, it, it's, I did not expect that. And I'm not, and, I, and listen, I, we've got, you know, 50 clients across 10 million in revenue to 2 billion in revenue. Some are publicly traded. We have four unicorns as clients. So I, I feel like I've got a pretty good base uh, of looking into this space, you know, around client dynamics and across different verticals and industries. I was really shocked by that. I thought Microsoft would have a much bigger presence, but you know, what I am, kind of seeing is how easy AWS is to use and how it is not tied to, you know, Microsoft kind of bundles in everything that Microsoft does where I think where it can. And and it's a great platform. There's some great stuff in there. I'm not 
saying it's negative. I'm just saying, based on what we're seeing, it seems to be, well, AWS is easier to use. It's not tied to credentials. Yep. You know, there seems to be a little bit more freedom and access. And I think they've just done a great job of making their information much more transparent around what their security is. Their, their compliance transparency pages, I think, are phenomenal. And, and I would, you know, I push and I use them. Yeah, I use them as an example when I'm telling our clients or anyone, hey, if you want to talk about your security, you really need to start replicating kind of how Amazon talks about what their security posture is. They publish, hey, we do these things. These are the controls that we meet. These are the you know standards that we meet. I mean, that transparency is huge. And they just make it very easy to tap into and and also use. I think they just, they've done a great you know service and, and kind of customer and user experience from people who are trying to go into the cloud. I'm just not seeing it with our customer base inside of Microsoft. So that's been shocking because I really thought Microsoft would have been mm -hmm. a solid number two, even above Google, but yep. you know, not so much. Okay, that is that one is really fascinating and surprising, I, but I, I understand now you know, where we're getting there. So let's look back at, at your career. And I think we learned a lot of lessons, but is there a piece of advice that you wish someone had given to you early in your career that maybe would have helped you smooth some roadblocks that you could pass on to other people? Yes, I've talked about this before and, and I did learn it later on in my career, but you know, in my early days being very technically focused and you know, really looking at things at the, you know, at the wire level, very systems and network focused, very technical roles. What I learned later on when I was in DoD was the power of what shaping and influencing policies meant. Because, you know, while I felt like I was, you know, doing really well from a technical standpoint, I could configure systems and manage systems and, and build great architectures and, and deploy them. I felt, okay, I have control over this. I have, you know, I'm, I'm steering the, the, the direction that this system is going to go. I'm empowering a business or a unit or on their mission with what I'm about to create and put, and put forward and, and secure. I was still held to overarching policies that were driven by policymakers. And I realized once I could understand and influence how technical writing and policy documentation were drafted, agreed on, even influenced, once I learned that, I learned how I could actually shape building more secure systems to enable businesses. And I'm glad I learned it when I did. I don't think if I had actually learned that when I was younger, I would have really truly taken it to, uh, to heart and it had been as meaningful. I had to think personally mature and professionally mature before I stepped into that role. But that was the biggest change for me going from, you know, real kind of geek, <laughs> technical, you know, yep. guy to somebody who could actually shape an information security program as a whole. So, you know, the, the advice really is, you know, even if you're a SOC analyst, even if you are a pen tester or you're in a hunt, hunt team or, or whatever, learn what is going on within policy because it'll help you mm -hmm. a lot more than you know. And conversely, if you've always been an auditor or a policy person, really try to understand what the actual technical components of what those policies mean, you know, to the folks who are reading them and using them and have to abide by them. So yeah, I you know, personally learned it and glad I did, but I'm not sure if I had learned it earlier, if it would have done me any better, but yeah. 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 I've often said the most powerful social engineering tool is PowerPoint because that's where all your budget starts from. Yeah. And in the, in the DOD, yeah. there so, was always the, that man gives good brief. Like if you put a PowerPoint right? yes. up oh, with oh my God. a solid plot chart, <laughs> you could, you could yeah. sway an entire room of people with stars and it's just like, Oh, right. absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, you always hated when you were briefing a room of stars and they never looked up and you're like, well, clearly I did not give good brief today. Yes, um, no, I missed them. So if you look about the, at the future, what opportunities for technology in its future are you really most excited about right now? I think a lot of what we're seeing come out of the security space that's, that's becoming easier to use and, and more affordable. I think we've been on this, this mm -hmm. curve of, you know, the, the new, I mean, look at, let's look at EDR, for instance, right? When those technologies first came out, the, the cost of that and, and the, the people who, who could even create, you know, mm -hmm. minor amount of suppliers, demand was high, cost was, was high. Now we're seeing just the innovation of, you know, who's creating these products, they're bringing the price points down. And again, kind of back to the middle market, financially, they're not set up like the Fortune 2000. They don't have these larger budgets, right? Yes, they're smaller in scale and size, but, you know, from a financial standpoint, they have less to spend. So they have to spend more appropriately. So seeing some of these technologies become more financially affordable 
and easier to use. You know, the, the, you know, when I look at, you know, I'll, I'll actually, I'll pick on two, two vulnerability scanning platforms, right? You look at Qualys and you look at Tenable. Capabilities yep. aside, right? They look night and day, right? What Tenable is doing from user interface, it just looks more appealing. I feel more comfortable using it. I still feel like I'm clicking around the 1980s if I'm in Qualys reports, right? It's these are, seem like simple things, but you know how people interact with you know apps and and everything. That is how that is how people are are operating and interacting with technology. We need to move those types of technologies to look and feel like that because that's what people are comfortable with. And the more people are comfortable with it, the less they're questioning the technicalities, right? So it's just it's just ease yeah. of use. And I think we're just seeing a, a tremendous push in making products, especially in the security space. Again, you got to remember, security is kind of a notch above understanding than IT. Most people don't even understand IT. So to get them to understand cybersecurity, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, right? So the easier we can make it, and the cheaper we can make it means that it's going to be in the hands of more people, more companies, and it's going to be used by more folks. So I think that's phenomenal. And I think we're finally coming to that part of the tide where, you know, again, more and more companies can take advantage of it, which hopefully means more and more companies are putting in place more security practices and capabilities that allow them to be more secure. I mean, that's kind of the end goal to all of this, right? Yeah. And it's interesting because I think we've spent the last like 10 years talking about gamification. And I suspect people learned the wrong lesson that they talked about, you know, incentives and scoring and badges rather than that sort of intuitive interface that makes gaming so attractive is how mm -hmm. easy it is to interact with versus, ooh, I got an extra loot. I mean, getting extra loot is always right. awesome. But so you have a very busy day. You jump from just sort of roll to roll to roll. What do you do to unwind? Avid reader. And unfortunately, it's kind of like, a, I don't know if it's unfortunate, but like, <laughs> it's a mix between, you know, I like reading white papers in the industry. And I also le like reading you know, leadership books. And, and then probably 10% of my time is is taken up with reading anything by Jack Kerouac. I'll, I'll, I think I've, re I've read On the Road 10 times in my life. It's my favorite book. And then everything else by him. But yeah, I unwind that way. And then if it's nice enough out, you know, I'll get on my bike. I, you know, I like to be, I used to be yep. very, very big into the outdoors. I've kind of curbed that back since, you know, in the last probably, you know, five to 10 years, you know, probably at least the extreme stuff, you know, now just kind of riding my bike or going for hikes versus mountain climbing and, you know, road racing. So as you get older and you have kids, you kind of right size, well, what type of risks should I actually be taking at this time in my life? So, um, yep. but yeah, it's, I don't know. I'm not the most interesting man in the world when it comes to what I like to do outside of work. I still read about security stuff, you know, even in my free time. It's kind of sad, I guess. You know something? I, I won't criticize that given some of my reading choices. But, you know, when you're the most interesting man at work, maybe you don't have to be the most interesting person outside of work. So quick bit of freeform. We've talked a lot about technology and growth, but often people have you know, pieces of wisdom around their life or just approach to reality. So do you have anything you'd love to share with our listeners? My dad said this to me when I left after graduating high school, you know, find something you love to do and then find somebody to pay to do it. He used an explicitive in there, but I think that's important. I've always, you know, I'm 42 now and I, I still think about that and tell people that you got to love what you do. You know, if you're not doing something you love, go find something you love to do and make that, you know, the reason you get up besides your family and, you know, keep, you know, honing mm -hmm. your craft. And I, I think it's a great way to look, we all have to work, right? I mean, no one, unless you're born yep. rich and you don't have to do anything, you know, we're all destined in some way to have to work and have a job. We might as well really like what we do. And uh, it's, it's funny. I, I've been fortunate enough to be, I think, gifted with a skill set that I do truly enjoy that allows me to, you know, use my brain and analytical thinking, and there's a need for it. So I feel truly blessed in that space. And hopefully other people can find, you know, what what theirs is, and you know, they can kind of live that life too. Yeah, yeah, I hope so for them. So thank you, Brian, I really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks, Andy. And for our listeners, you can catch us on all of your favorite podcasting platforms. I'm Andy Ellis for Cloud Security Reinvented. Thank you for checking out this episode of Cloud Security Reinvented, brought to you by Orca Security. 
Orca Security detects and prioritizes cloud security risks for AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud without the gaps in coverage, alert fatigue, and operational costs of agents. Please follow Cloud Security Reinvented wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts or visit orca.security slash podcast to get immediate access to all of the latest episodes.